Welcome to History's Influence. Many centuries ago, on the vast Eurasian steppe, a woman was abducted by an enemy clan's chieftain and was forced into marriage with the man. She eventually gave birth to a son named Temujin Borjigan. Upon his birth, the little baby was clutching a large and ominous object in his right fist. His mother tried to uncurl his rigid fingers one by one. Temujin was holding a large blood clot, a sign from the heavens that he would become a great warrior. After uniting the bickering tribes of the Mongolian plateau, he held a large assembly in 1206 AD, known as a Kurultai. He formally adopted the title we know him as today, Genghis Khan. The Mongols would go on to conquer the largest contiguous land empire in history. The story of death and carnage which ensued is one of the most famous tales in all of history. But what if the Mongol conquests never happened? What would happen to the vast regions of the world spared from their wrath? Would this change be positive? All these questions and more will be answered in this alternate history. In order to prevent the Mongol conquests from occurring, we're going to need to prevent Genghis Khan from taking power. Temujin was likely named after a Tatar warrior his father had defeated. The Borjigan clan was respected and held a long history within Mongolia, but had fallen out of grace, with his father Yusege being a minor chieftain. We could try to prevent the clan from existing, which was founded around three centuries before Temujin's birth. But for simplicity, we'll stick with getting rid of the boy himself. This will keep the timeline relevant to when the Mongol Empire existed and onwards. In any case, his father had died at a young age. This fractured his relatively small power base, which Temujin was too young to maintain. This doomed both him and his family to a vulnerable upbringing. The young boy showed his strong-willed character, which caught the attention of others. Purportedly, a Mongol clan named the Taichiyuds were concerned about him, believing he may have become a nuisance as he aged. Temujin was often held prisoner in his youth, due to his clan's lack of allies. So to prevent his rise, we are going to assume one of his escape attempts is botched and he is killed as a result. Or perhaps he resists capture and is killed in the process. This video is going to fixate a lot on Genghis Khan as a pivotal figure in history. If we want to know whether an equivalent invasion will take place without the man, it's important to clarify two opposing views of history on the matter. The first is known as Great Man Theory, coined by Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle. It's pretty self-explanatory that great men in history, due to their own characteristics and abilities, are able to have a decisive impact on history. The second would be known as Social History, which fixates on bottom-up developments through structural change, starting with the experiences of normal people, mostly peasants for civilizational history. Both views hold validity, depending on the circumstances or topics that are being discussed. I believe social history explains the opportunistic context in which Genghis Khan found himself in, but Great Man Theory is essential in explaining the degree of success the Mongol Empire had achieved. To begin, the Mongolian plateau did not merely consist of Mongols fighting each other. The plateau was a region with many different ethnicities, and therefore possibilities boiling under the surface. A tough terrain and constant fighting between different clans and peoples had created hardened warriors who over the centuries would create large steppe empires. Most of the Mongolian plateau was previously ruled by the Lao dynasty, a Chinese dynasty of Khitan ethnic origin, cousins of the Mongols. This lasted from 916 AD to 1125 AD, where we see them replaced by the Jin dynasty, Jurchen in origin. Similar to the Lao, they ruled in northern China, however they had lost control of the Mongolian plateau. Chinese dynasties, including the Jin, would play nomadic groups off of each other to prevent their unification and the ensuing threat. In the micro scale this was effective. Take the weakening of the Borjigan clan, which was partially caused by Jin interference. But on the macro scale, we see many large steppe empires form, coming from many different groups, not just the Mongols, Kittens or Jurchens. Ironically, one of the reasons Genghis Khan invaded China in the first place 
was as a preemptive strike from these sorts of measures. I believe the nomads in the plateau, with the reasons we have outlined, will be able to overpower the Jin dynasty's desire and create a unified state, perhaps even conquering the Jin for themselves. Don't forget that the Jin only controlled the northern half of China that didn't have all of China to pull upon for defense. It's also argued that the favorable climate, being warmer and wetter, in the steppe of Temujin's period, helped allow for their nomadic pastoralist lifestyle to prosper, increasing the number of horses and livestock, helping to fuel the Mongol conquests. Their armies were nearly entirely cavalry based after all. It's hard to say how much of an impact this truly had, but I'm fairly convinced by this climactic argument. But despite this steppe unification, I do not believe this new fighting force would become the same fighting force as the Mongols in our own timeline. It was Genghis Khan's genius which allowed him to unite the fragmented nomadic tribes into the largest contiguous empire in history, and not just into another large nomadic empire which harasses a civilization or two. He was able to integrate defeated armies into his own, creating a self-perpetuating feedback loop of conquest. This extended well past his death to the peak of the Mongol Empire. Effective military tactics were implemented, such as faking retreats, faking larger armies using dummies on horses, <laughs> and kidnapping siege engineers for the creation of siege equipment to carry out effective sieges, rather than running around with horses outside of cities not capturing them. Through the recent invention of gunpowder in China, rudimentary hand grenades were used as well. The Great Khan took a very meritocratic, competency-based approach towards his appointments, whether it be military generals, administrators, or other positions of importance. The Mongols were also religiously tolerant. They believed in their sky god Tangri, which was also the universe itself, and would integrate this broad faith along other religions they would encounter. They would later convert to other faiths as their empire split apart. None of these factors were particularly unique to Genghis. He didn't invent hand grenades or the idea of meritocracy. But it is the culmination of these factors being applied, stemming from one great leader. This is what suggests to me that an equivalent invasion force to the Mongols won't be occurring in this new timeline. In the long run, an equivalent massive invasion would simply become infeasible. Military technology will be the biggest issue, as the developing use of gunpowder was helping nullify the strength of cavalry. You see this advantage clearly around the late 1500s onwards, during Russia's time of expansion in the East. Both Russia and the Qing Dynasty of China successfully ended the age of the nomadic threat. However, we may not see these two nations in this new timeline. But the technological clock was ticking. I believe as time would go on, the chances for a massive nomadic empire would decrease. We will assume for the sake of the timeline that this unlikely threat is never realized. As previously mentioned, we will see the steppe region north of China be unified. It may happen around the same time as Mongol unification, or it may take a few decades to a couple of centuries to occur. The different group and their flavor, alongside the advantages they would adopt, would determine how effective they would be within the parameters we've given. Not to mention the basic limits of distance, geography, and the defensibility of civilizations they would neighbor. Because of this large degree of uncertainty, I won't attempt to speculate the exact nature of this nomadic state or its longevity. If it's not a Mongol group unify the region, a Mongol identity may never be solidified. For example, the Tatars of the region may predominate. You may see another group unify and create an ethnogenesis out of disparate groups, or better define their own group. Or it may be like earlier steppe empires, where the Mongolic, Turkic, Jurchen and other elements work together but never truly unite as a people. Something important to mention is Mongolia's religion. Tibetan Buddhism became the dominant religion during the later Yuan period. This was the period where the Mongols were kicked out of China and lingered in the steppe. So we may instead see a maintenance of the Tengri sky god faith, or perhaps other religions such as Islam would take influence, which could strongly impact the culture of the region. A wild card I'd love to mention would be the Nestorian Christian faith. The Nestorian Christians are an early schismatic branch of Christianity. 
It was initially a majority faith in the Fertile Crescent, but spread to be a small religion throughout Asia, being adopted by some Mongol tribes. The Pax Mongolica, a concept imitating the Pax Romana of the Roman Empire, was a period of peace and prosperity which occurred after the Mongol conquests, lasting over a century. Paper, gunpowder and the compass made their way from China to Europe through the Unified Silk Road, a trade route re-established by the Mongols, which was defunct for centuries. Without these trade routes being re-established, such technological advancements may be delayed in their arrival to Europe. The route was eventually disintegrated alongside the eventual collapse of the Mongol Empire's successor states, particularly in Iran. Without such a direct trade route being established in this new timeline, we may see a weakening of maritime trading states in Europe. Take the Venetians, who partook in a direct trade agreement with the Mongols. The relationship between these trade routes and the powers who dominated them are also argued to have later incentivized Spanish and Portuguese colonization. Regarding European advancement, be it colonization or technology, I'm unsure the trade route facilitated only due to the Mongols was the main cause. It's not as if Europe was closed off beforehand, particularly when needing to trade and compete with the Islamic powers. I'd argue Western Europe would be relatively unchanged from these factors as a result. There would be another major factor to consider however, and that would be the transport of the Black Death to Europe. The bubonic plague is an enormous topic that deserves its own standalone video from the Mongol scenario, so I will try to keep my thoughts relatively brief. The Golden Horde, a successor state of the Mongols, attacked the Genoese port city of Kaffa in the Black Sea. They flung plague victims into the city using trebuchets. Genoese ships from Kaffa then travelled to the port cities in Europe, spreading the disease which then reached all corners of the continent. The Black Death is estimated to have killed around 30 to 50% of Europe's population. It took around two centuries for Europe's population to recover to its previous levels. The Middle East was also devastated, with around 30% of its population dying as a high estimate. An interesting point to mention is that there is little evidence of any plague in China or India at the time. China was traditionally considered the origin point of the disease, but this now appears untenable. The epidemic first appears within the Golden Horde. However, genetic and archaeological evidence seems to suggest an origin within the Tian Shan Mountains around modern Kyrgyzstan. The Mongol successor states of the time were large and held fairly good relations with each other, helping the disease spread to Kafar in the first place. So without the Mongol unification of these lands, I believe the Black Death would never have reached Europe's shores in this period, or it would have at least been delayed in doing so. This would be fantastic news, right? Well, perhaps not. The large number of deaths in Europe was arguably beneficial for the continent, as it strengthened the value of labour and therefore wages. This helped gradually dismantle the feudal system, as the peasants had more bargaining power. So, we may actually see a less economically advanced Europe as a result, less able to exert power and dominance into the colonial era. Europe was the richest area per capita in the world on the precipice of colonisation, but that may not be the case in this new timeline. There were notable advancements in medicine which may not be made in this new timeline. For example, quarantining individuals who are sick was a practice first introduced during the Black Death. To focus on warfare, the eternal conflict between European states was interrupted by the plague. Truces were initiated in the Hundred Years' War between England and France, for example. Perhaps a different outcome could have occurred in the conflict, or it may have been resolved in the same fashion but more quickly. Casimir the Great famously brought Poland into a golden age during this era. For example, he acquired land and initiated the settlement of Jews into Poland. Poland also had an easier time given the weakening of the Kievan Rus, as they were occupied by the Mongols, they were the precursor state of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. This Mongol occupation won't be happening in this new timeline, we'll be exploring this properly in part 2. There's simply too much to cover regarding the Black Death, so I'll leave the topic there. I think I've covered it a healthy amount. Or should I say unhealthy? Putting the plague aside, the Pax Mongolica we were discussing came at a steep cost in a more direct fashion. 
The Mongol conquests killed approximately 11% of the world's population. This was about 40 million people out of 360 million. Entire cities would be slaughtered. However, the Mongols would always prefer to have a city surrender peacefully, which actually worked often due to their menacing reputation. The era of peace their bloodshed established was not to last. The Mongol successor states dismantled after a relatively short period of time. The echoes of empire, rather than the empire itself, were to have a larger impact on history. A common fun fact we often hear is that 1 in 200 men alive today are the descendants of Genghis Khan. It comes from a 2003 study which found a Y chromosome lineage, so a male lineage, present in 1 in 200 men. The pattern of variations suggested a roughly 1,000 year old origin in Mongolia, suggesting it was most likely Genghis Khan's impact which caused the genetic occurrence. Other studies disagree with this assertion. For example, skeletons of high-class Mongols of the period don't hold the same DNA lineage, reducing the chances Genghis had that lineage. Claims of weakness in statistical power also exist. I would argue it's feasible, even if uncertain given the points mentioned. He must have left some sort of genetic impact in my eyes, given that he is rumoured to have sired over 100 children located around many areas of his empire. We're going to leave it there for this video. In part 2, we'll be looking at the Mongol successor states and what will happen to their regions without them existing, particularly China, Iran and Russia, alongside surrounding areas and unexpected topics. This has been History's Influence. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe. Catch you on part 2.